you are alive. Good morning. Dawn is a very soporific affair this morning. You can see the eastern horizon here in the northeastern corner of South Africa trying to sort of show some sign of enthusiasm for the day, but we are blanketed in gray cloud this morning. There's just a little bit of natural light, as you can see there, but mostly it's still very dark here on our first safari for this morning, the 3rd of March. It's very good to have you with us, and you are on a live safari, as many of you will probably know, and if those of you who don't know, you've just stumbled across this website or YouTube stream, and you think, what on earth is going on? Well, you're on a live sunrise safari with Wild Earth, and the show is called Safari Live. My name is James Henry, and on uh, camera today we have David the Elephant Eastor, and he is... <laughs> Well, he's filming me. On the other vehicle is Scott. He's being filmed by Jean Dre. And in the final control, we have Luis on the vocals and on the keys is Nikki. There we go. I got it right. Now, by live safari, I mean that it is interactive and we'd like to talk to you. Uh, Nikki will be operating the computer through which you will be able to tweet hashtag safari live or you can email questions at wildearth.tv or you can send questions on the YouTube stream. I think there's a chat function there that seems to function in some unfathomable fashion. And so please do talk to us, send us comments, ask us questions about Africa, ask us questions about South Africa, ask us questions about anything you'd like within reason, and we will do our best to answer anything that you have to ask. Uh, my plan this morning is to, we've just sort of come to the central area here to have a quick squiz around the place, but we're going to head up north to the northern boundary of the reserve. The reserve is called Juma Private Game Reserve. To the west of us is Arethusa, where we also traverse, and we are part of, of course, the iconic Kruger National Park. We're going to head north and then east to the far east, see if we can find a Singapore noodle stand and perhaps a leopard or two on the way. That was a small joke to the deadpan face. Okay, that's the plan, David. Are you happy with that plan? Sounds good to me. Okay, marvellous. Well, we go. The weather apparently is 23 degrees Celsius, which I believe is 77 degrees Fahrenheit for those of you who are still operating with that, uh, shall we say, slightly antiquated system. Right, here we go. I'll reacquaint myself with the cockpit of the Land Rover. Try not to unplug my earpiece so that I can hear Louise talking to me. And on we will go. It's amazing how fast it gets light in the morning. It was pretty much dark. I mean, a minute and a half before we stopped here to sort of set up our opening shot, and the light is coming. I don't know how bright it's going to be in the morning, but we do know that it's going to be a stinker of a day. We'll probably hit about 35 or 36 degrees Celsius, which is around about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, somewhere around there. While I decide exactly on a course of action, let's head across to Scott. He's headed south, and we'll catch up with him, and I'll see you later. Good day, and, and welcome on board, everyone. My name is Scott, and I am teamed up with jean Dre on camera. Uh, our, our plans are just like James's. Uh, Although initially we are going to be heading far to the southwestern corner of Juma and only then will we head east along our southern boundary. We may well reconvene on the eastern boundary somewhere around Central Road. And from there we can possibly plan our next attack. But what you often find is, and I can almost guarantee that this will happen this morning, is that even though we've got a plan to check certain roads to a certain point, that could well change. And if we find something interesting along the way, of course, we will divert. We did hear a brief grunt. It sounded like of a lion. Ooh. It was just kind of one, one call. It's difficult to tell where it came from or how far away it was exactly whether we were imagining things, but I'm hoping that we may get lucky and come across some signs of lion there. It was a large herd of buffalo moving on to Juma last night, and the 
there's a strong chance that some lion may have been following that large herd in the knowledge that there are some easy opportunities to snipe a youngster or an old female. So time will tell if we get lucky there, but it sounds like James already found you some other animals. So enjoy. Well, there is a full frame of a young elephant bull who is wandering sort of towards us very calmly in the morning. He's just grazing along, and uh, I felt a bit bad for saying this. When I saw him initially, I said, he's been drinking, which, of course, in the human context sounds, uh, well, a little bit insulting. He has been drinking, though. He's had some water. You can see his trunk is wet. He's probably been at the Jumadam pan, having a little bit of a drink there. And there he goes. He's just a little bit inquisitive, smelling us. See, they're turning his trunk towards us and doesn't like uh, David's shampoo, obviously, and so he's moving slowly away. We're going to reverse. He's probably about, I don't know, about 30 meters from us now, which is about 140 feet. And he's just feeding quietly along on the grass. Now, what's interesting is that elephants and quite a few other animals at the moment have had to kind of move on to their winter diets quite early in the season, simply because there hasn't been any sort of summer feed, no insects for the insect eaters, no grass for the grazers. And the elephants, which was more than eating grass now, have been having to resort to eating their winter diet of bark and leaves. And he is quite obviously grazing, so he's enjoying the green shoots that have come up as a result of a little bit of rain we had almost a week ago. Perfectly at peace is this elephant in the dawn. Hmm. You see that very obvious display there with his foot? That is quite typical of an elephant that's just watching you, feeling slightly awkward. I think it's your son, Matty, called his uh, pet iguana, Dyson, of course, uh, after Scott. I'm not sure. Oh, someone else calls an iguana called Dyson. It wasn't Matty. And Helena, uh, you said because you thought we'd all feel bad, the rest of us, or me, that I would feel bad and upset that I hadn't also uh, had my name attached to that of a large reptile. You have named your goldfish, Henry 1, Henry 2, and Henry 3. Uh, that is very kind, um, I think. Thank you, Helena, for naming your goldfish after me. I shall tell my father immediately that despite the fact that I have failed to produce him any male grandchildren, uh, there are at least three goldfish in Southern, Calif Southern California that share our name. I'm sure he will be deeply relieved and the pressure to produce him male heirs uh, will, um, will cease. Thank you very much, Helena. Now, I'm not going to go through here, it's a bit thick, and he's so peaceful, this elephant, that I don't want to make too much noise as we go through the bush, but you can just see him kind of shadow moving through there. We saw him earlier, just before, shall I turn the light off, Dave, does it help? There we go. We saw him earlier as we pulled out of camp, and he didn't really like the light there. You can see him just melting through the bush. But now, without the light on him, he's just totally at peace. Now, he's, he's not too far from us, but you can't hear him move. Hello, Natasha in Ontario. You've noticed that this elephant, of course, has got two large white things coming out of his mouth, and you want to know what the purpose of those tusks is. The tusks are multi-purposed, Natasha. Of course, they are used for defense at some stages. And this is a young bull, so those tusks will get a lot larger. Although I don't think that he'll ever be a massive carrier of ivory. And so 
So they are used for defense and for fighting. They're used for display. So I think that you'll find that very large tusked elephants perhaps have more luck with the ladies than the smaller ones. Uh, then they are also, most importantly, used as a tool for feet. We're going to leave him now. He's wandering so peaceably off through there that I don't want to follow him. Um, so they're used for feeding. They crack the outer shell of a tree, so they kind of take off the bark, and then the trunk grabs the initial chip and pulls off strips. And I'll, you can show, we can show you on trees where the elephant's tusks have dug in. They do that. And they're also used, what else are they used for? That's, I suppose, that would be the major thing they're used for. And then if they're feeding on things that they want to break, um, tree, you know, if they want to break branches or snap small saplings, they'll hold them with their trunks, pull them over the tusk, and then kind of use them there. And then you can see in some elephants, they have a groove cut across one of the tusks, and that's from continual use breaking off grass, pulling trees across that particular groove, and snapping things, and so a very important part of the feeding apparatus of an elephant. It's not to say they can't survive without them, but they do certainly use them extensively for feeding. Okay, let's head across to Scott, get an update from him. We are heading north. Good start and well done to James for tracking you down an elephant so quickly. We are about to turn onto our southern boundary where we will then start heading directly east towards hopefully some pretty scenes as the sun begins to rise. James, you may find, may be able to provide you guys with better sunrise views. Did I say sunsets? I may have. Uh, sunrise views because he is more elevated than, than where we are here on the southern boundary. He's making his way to the northern boundary, which is considerably higher up. So I'm just gonna slowly coast along this road and uh, hope that we will find some tracks coming from right to left into Juma. For those of you who may be joining for the first time, the, the boundaries for us are merely roads that the animals can pass over, but we cannot, so it's the right way to have things, I guess, that the animals have freedom and we don't. So roles reverse from how things typically work with wildlife and humans. Hello, Genevieve in New York. You are asking kindly whether or not we can try and find you a mapani beehive. Mapani bees are a stingless bee, um, very, very small. They look just kind of like flies, I guess. And we'll definitely be able to try and do that, Genevieve. I know where there was a hive. I haven't been back to it for quite some time, but it's close to the road on Hippo Pools Road. So we should possibly be able to find you some views of them. Interestingly, the entrance to their hive is a tiny little kind of semi-translucent flute or straw, you could say, that they've made out of wax. And that's what they land in and go through this little tube into the hive and that's also where they exit from. So quite easy to work out where their hives are once you found that little tube. So we will head up there and have a look. <laughs> Hello, Lisa in Idaho. You are wondering whether or not I am a morning person. And depending on the activity that I'm required to perform, yes and no. If I'm in a wilderness area, I can wake up very early in the morning and uh, have a smile on my face and be excited for the adventure that lies ahead. Um, of course, that may not be the case if I was in a city having to wake up knowing that I'd need to put on a shirt and tie and go into an office. That would be different. So. That's why I say yes and no. Um, I really do love the mornings, Archer. 
But that's not to say that the initial struggle of becoming vertical is not one that I'm sometimes challenged with. Um, I set my alarm, I do three times, so 20 past four, 25 past four, and half past four uh, are the, the three alarm clocks that I set. So I'll snooze, snooze, and then usually get up on the 4.30, but sometimes 4.40 living on the edge, I'll get up. So sometimes it requires several snoozes before I can erect myself. And we are fortunate that we are amongst a whole band of coffee lovers and we drink only the finest filter coffee. So that's also something that aids in our perkiness in the morning. At the moment, uh, Lou tells me we're actually drinking Italian filter coffee. <laughs> Didn't know that. Thanks, Lou. <laughs> so even though we are in the middle of the African bush, we live a very comfortable existence out here. I just stopped to reverse there just to make sure I wasn't seeing things regarding tracks, which I was. Always good to double check. If you find, you know, you can have Lots of impala tracks which were there, and then if three or four of them all line up in the correct spots, it could appear like a, you know, a paw or, or, or a slightly bigger track. Zoe, regarding tracking, you're wondering how many different animals we have with hooves on the property. Let's go through the list. Wastenschwein, Warthog, number one. Wastenschwein is German for Warthog. Zebra, two. Buffalo, three. We'll do the spiral horned antelopes next. Kudu, in Yala Bushbuck. Then we'll do the two miniature antelopes, the Diker and the Steenbuck. Then we shall do the most numerous, the Impala. Who are we forgetting? Who are we? Ah, giraffe, 10. I think it's, ah, oh, wildebeest is another one, 11. I've done zebra loo, thank you. Um, so we're on 11 with the wildebeest. Sable from time to time, been documented once at the Juma Dam. 12. I think uh, the last time a sable was seen was 17 years prior to that. <laughs> so, so sneaky 12. Um, yeah, I think that is all, but I'm sure some of you may have noted that I may have missed one. So feel free to let me know if that is the case. Oh, there's a, a Korhan ahead of us on the road here, on the side of the road. Apologies, a black-bellied bustard. Their names keep changing. Initially they were Korhans, now they're bustards or vice versa. And some of you may know this as the champagne bird. But we've got something far more exciting happening across on James's vehicle. Off you go. I can't believe it, everyone. Look, they are here. This is the Aubrey's Road Den. Yay, this is fantastic. So I was right, they did move. They've, they're all here, except, I think, Madam. Except Madam and the really little ones. So Corky and her two little ones are here. June is here. November's here. So Pretty must be here or has been here. The male. Hello. How's your new home? It's not as nice as the old one. Hello, Wyatt. You are nine years old and you really want to see hyenas. Well, here you go. There's now one actually under the car. There's a hyena under the car. David, he's probably going to pop up there. Is he there? Don't see him. <laughs> Yeah, he came out the front. He's the one that's just in front there. That's the one. Morning, June. 
Yes, that's Louise says. It looks like they missed me. I agree. We drove up here and they came out to say hello. That's so cool. <laughs> so, just to keep you, those of you who perhaps haven't been informed as to what's going on, so these guys were found ubiquitously at the other den off, um, off Vubu Road for almost eight weeks. Then it started to smell a bit rough around there and I thought maybe they'll move and they didn't. And then they had two experiences. A lion came and stuck her head into the den. And then they had a big conflict with the wild dogs the other day. And then the den became empty. And I only found Madam, the matriarch, with her two youngsters. And then I thought maybe these guys had moved. And we came to look here. We saw tracks, didn't see any hyenas. But this is where they are. And it's not nearly as kind of um, shady and nice as the other place. I'm so happy we found them again. Morning. Yes. So this is a, one of the Ds. This is D2 who I'm looking at here. You can't see, of course, because she's just below the car. D2 he, sorry, that's the little male. That, of course, is pretty mother of November, as far as I'm aware. Yes. Now, we still have not seen the scarbacked female who was attacked by those wild dogs the other day. Ten of them set upon her. Listen to them calling. Oh, oh. oh then they're disappearing back. I just want to try and move, but I don't want to obviously harm. There we go. Okay, they're all clear of the car. Let's just move a little bit closer. You were wondering about the scarback female, and I'm afraid I just can't tell you. I don't know what's happened to her or where she is, but that's not unusual. You know, there were, I hadn't, she's not commonly at the den at all. So for her not to be here, that's not, that's not strange. Let's just ease up here and have a look. You can see where they've been living now. Oh, look, 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 they're all here. Look, look, there's the little one. Look. So, madam, you two are here. She's also brought them across. Now, how on earth they're all fitting in here? I've put, I've put my head into the hole there. And it's not deep, so they must have re-excavated it over the course of the last few days. Road, maybe you can tell me. This one is, I think, one of the males from February last year. Definitely a male. I think that's who he is. Might be the one they call Ntumbela. <laughs> Hello. Yes, good morning. I'm not sure why you were smelling my car. Can you all take a step back, please? We can't see you on screen. Thank you, that's much better. <laughs> now, I just want to reiterate here, these are not tame animals. As soon as they recognize me for what I am as a human being, as soon as I stand up, um, they always remove themselves. They just see the vehicle, though, as something different and it's something interesting. You know, I mean, it must be fairly boring, I suppose, living in a termite mound your whole life. And then when we pop along and say hello, uh, they're generally fascinated, especially the little ones. But if I was to stand up, if they were to sort of recognize me for what I am, then they'd be a lot more, a lot more nervous. This is just fantastic. And, of course, we can get but closer than we could at the other one because there are no trees around here. Um, I just think this is fantastic. This is unbelievable. <laughs> Can you hear them falling? And thank you, Chris Rogue and Ben Hopper 
you say thank you, Indiana James. I think that's quite a nice name. Um, you say thank you. You're most happy that we found the new den. Well, I'm also very, very happy. <laughs> I just wanted to try and get a shot with my phone because they are so close. Who are you? What is your name? Now, love dogs on YouTube. You want to know if they moved in because of the threat or because of it smelt bad. I think you'll find that they moved because of the threat. I think so. But I'm not sure. I mean, look, those lion, that lion interaction, that lion interaction was a little bit sort of... Um, I mean, it was a while back. It was it, they didn't move immediately, but they certainly moved straight after the wild dog interaction. Although that wild dog interaction was closer to this area than the other den, so there's probably an element of disease or element of smelliness about it. I, I'm not sure why they would have chosen this one though, because this one is, I mean, is much less protected, for example, than the the one on Gallego Shortcut. So I. Yeah, I'm going to say it's probably both. I'm not really... It's not uncommon, though, for hyenas to move dens. And, in fact, they were at the Mvubu one for probably two or three weeks longer than would be normal. And, of course, the term normal for wild systems is uh, normally pretty ridiculous. And Mark, yes, I think we think that's why they would move dens, you know, parasite load, and once it gets too much, they will move dens, and that's exactly as you suggested. Not quite, though, in the same way that a wild dog den will. As soon as they, of course, as soon as things get vaguely smelly or diseased at a wild dog den, they'll move. They'll move every two or three weeks. And I think it's because also, listen to them, The other thing with hyenas is that they can protect themselves far more than wild dogs can. And so they don't really mind if the smell of a den attracts predators because, in fact, most predators will be much too nervous to come anywhere near them. Whereas with wild dogs, if they have a smelly den, then it will attract the attentions of leopards. Leopards will often try and take wild dog pups. Uh, it will attract the attentions of hyenas and lions as well. And so they just have to be a lot more careful about it. That's very sweet. Look at that. Just trying to identify exactly who we have here. We've definitely got all the cubs. But do we have all the males? The two males. Thank you, Luke the Duke on YouTube. You um, say that <laughs> I am the hyena whisperer. Uh, Luke the Duke, that's, uh, I think, very kind. Um, I'll happily take that, um, that moniker. Let's head across to Scott, see what he's got to show us. You see, I couldn't agree with the Luke. James often says that I'm the one that finds lots of interesting things like birds or this or that, but this is now the second hyena den that he has located in a row, but we are in luck here. We have found a tiny, tiny puff adder. Look at the way it's moving. That's fascinating. How cool is this snake? Now, I need to be careful. Even though this is absolutely tiny, um, if it were to bite me, I would be in serious, serious trouble. They have a cytotoxic venom that will attack your flesh. You can see it's a very 
kind of fat snake. It's short and fat. It's got that big diamond head and fascinating, fascinating markings. I love the way it was moving like a sidewinder there. I um, wasn't expecting that. Um, haven't really seen them move like that before. When they're not in a rush, uh, and how it was initially moving was in a caterpillar-like motion or a rectilinear fashion. So you'll usually just see one solid line in the sand. A straight line, not a serpentine motion. How cool is this little guy? It's tiny. It could well have hatched very recently, and with puff adders, you may often find a whole nest of them where they've hatched, so there could be a lot of youngsters around here. You are too cool. But what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to usher them off the road. Obviously, with this incredible camouflage, they can become prey to... Here we go, here's the rectilinear motion. See how it moves almost dead straight like a caterpillar? Rolling its rib cage in order to propel itself forward. Too cool! A little bit further, mister. You're not quite safe yet. As you were, continue on. Now, as you can see, he's not once struck out at me or the stick, indicating that snakes will want to escape and not attack. So even though the snake is highly, highly venomous, look at how well its camouflage works now as it moves off into the bush. Even though this is a highly venomous snake, you saw its main goal was to try and escape. It never once lashed out or struck at the stick. Too cool. As I was saying though, well done to James for finding the hyena den. It sounds like you guys had a great time there. No, no, I've said to a lot of you that I'd love to see an African rock python uh, before I leave, but that was equally as awesome. A tiny little puff adder, beautiful, beautiful color, cryptic coloration and markings on their skin. Hi, Lance. You've just queried whether young snakes are more dangerous than bigger snakes. Um, I would beg to differ uh, simply because they'll, they'll contain the same venom, but they will have smaller venom glands, smaller teeth, and therefore they won't be able to pump as much venom into you when they bite you as a larger individual of the same species. So. Um, I think they're equally, uh, if not slightly less uh, dangerous due to the, the, the smaller venom load. Morning, guys. How are you doing? Yeah, very good, man. Very good. How's it, man? Oh, Scott, nice to meet you. Okay, um, guys, we're going to send you back to James quickly at the hind end, and then I can chat to these guys and get an update as to what's going on. Oh, no, cancel that. Cancel that. I'm just going to chat with the guys. Any updates? Any news? Okay. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Well, that's good news. Thanks very much, Jason. And then Justin Combe on. Okay. Okay. Cool, guys. Well, have fun, and we will catch up with you later. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, well, there's some good news. The guys just told us that there's some lion tracks coming north into our property. And that's wonderful because we did earlier find some tracks of a leopardess, probably Karula, going out. So, we've got equilibrium. Now, the snake that we just saw was tiny. They can, in this area, get to about that long. is coming from. Now, like I said, uh, the very simple reasoning for me, we will just watch animals um, and not interfere with their day, but I'm sure a lot of you 
will understand the very basic logic behind that little manoeuvre. You'll also notice that even though we did interfere, it's not like we gave that snake a hard time or a heart attack. No different to it having to defend itself against possible predators or no different from it having to deal with a herd of buffalo walking past it. You know, they, they do get frights, all the animals do from time to time. Yes, good morning. How are you? Very good, Andres. Um, just past Twin Dams, you'll see I've circled it. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. How's this with morning traffic? Two vehicles in three minutes. Micah, you were asking whether or not I had that snake on my wish list. It was the African rock python that was on my wish list, not the puff adder. Although any snake will do. And I'm certainly happy with that little critter. I'm sure it may have been a lot of your guys' first puff adder. So any firsts or any rare sightings, really, we've got to be happy with, and we don't see snakes that often. I did, however, see an adult puff adder about this long, about three nights ago, I think, when Nikki and I were on our way back from another camp after visiting some friends that were in the area. However, you've asked how big do puff adders get. Like I say, uh, about this size in South Africa, uh, sorry, in South Africa, in the Sabi Sands. It's not uh, prime habitat for them. In other parts of South Africa, they'll be a very different coloration and also possibly a little bit larger. I think up to about a meter in length would be your average top end size of a puff adder, and they'll get really fat. I mean, they are uh, very adder-like, well they are adders, so they're kind of like rattlesnakes rather, something that a lot of Americans will be able to relate to. Where are these male lion tracks? I think it could have been a little bit further to the east of our eastern boundary. This is our eastern boundary here, sadly. There's a transfer company taking some guests to put spreads, obviously, into their safari. Sad times. Hmm. James Taylor, you've heard that young snakes cannot control the amount of venom. Uh, that they inject when they bite. That's possible. Um, that certainly is possible, James. I haven't uh, heard that, though. So I think we're going to have to do a little bit more research. Uh, the tricky thing is with a lot of things that you may hear, um, regardless of how accurate you may think the websites or bookers that you're reading, um, it's not, it's often not always true. Textbooks are sometimes wrong. And I'm not saying that's the case now. I'm, I'm certainly not saying that because I'm, I'm not certain whether that is or not the case, but I do find that hard to believe. It's always worth doing a little bit of a second check if possible. Unless you've already done that, then I'm simply wrong. <clears throat> But like I say, I mean, just the fact that, James, the, 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 the snake's head is so much smaller, therefore the venom gland is going to be small, the, the fang that it's going to be injecting you through is small, it, it, it makes it hard to believe that that is in fact the case. Even if they can't control the amounts of venom, just the fact that everything's so much smaller would make it not necessarily more dangerous. Good, the hyenas are back out and playing about, so off you go. Well, there, it was born in November. 
welcome back everybody so, uh, to the den. We are doing a virtual reality segment as well at the moment. I mean, can you imagine viewing this incredible scene uh, in the sort of surrounding cylindrical 360 degrees where you can see the sun coming up on the left, you can see the hyena on the top, you can turn your head and look at one of the adults lying at the entrance to where the little ones have just gone. Then you can see the others to the right-hand side where they're playing with D2, the little male December cub. It's just fantastic. We came around the other side. And it's interesting, we did that because it seemed that most of the activity was this side. And as soon as we did that, Pretty, who's the own sort of, I suppose she'd be the lead female here at the moment, moved to the other side. And the rest of them don't really m seem to mind where we are, but the big adults, it's interesting, don't seem to be, they're not nearly as fascinated by the vehicle as the youngsters. They really kind of ignore it totally. Oh, that's Madam there, I think. That's Madam lying at the entrance. That's the matriarch. Lisa G and Ravi, you want to know where this new hyena gen den is. Um, remember, it's not a new hyena den. This is an old one. They've used it a few times. And it's off a road called Aubrey's Road, which is to the northeast of where, sorry, northwest of where their last den was off Vubu Road, and they're actually in a line, and Vubu Road being the most southerly, so that's sort of the southeasterly one, then in the middle is the Gallagher shortcut one, and this one is quite close to our northwestern boundary. So if we were to go exactly northwest from here, we would hit Sydney's Dam in Biffles Hook, probably within sort of 500 meters or half a kilometer. Look at them all, having the best time. roll on me a very good question you want to know is hyenas grow as fast as dogs and cats lisa roll on me i think they absolutely grow that fast um because they are predators they're normally bo they're both slightly more altricial than at least they're born slightly more precocial than other dogs and cats and what that means is that they're slightly more developed they're not born blind and they're not they are born with teeth which is quite interesting but like Richard III was rumored to have been born. But that's the time. Another discussion for another time. Uh, but they do then grow very quickly. It's an interesting one. I'm just trying to think, do they grow as fast? Yes, they do. In fact, they definitely grow as fast. I mean, if I look at these little cubs and I compare them with the first time we saw the wild dog pups, the wild dog pups are now almost, ooh, what are they now? Probably nine months old. And they are almost, almost the same size as the fully grown adults. A nine-month-old hyena. We've got a, oh, we've got a yearling hyena here. I don't think he's in view at the moment. That's actually, no, that's him there. I think that's him playing there. Um, I'll just try and, there. My finger's on his back now. I think that's a year-old hyena. So almost the same size as a fully grown adult, and it's, I think he's a male, so he won't get much bigger than that. He'll fill out a bit, but he won't get much bigger. So, yeah, I mean, in a roundabout way, I'm saying, yes, I think they grow pretty much the same speed, maybe slightly slower. But now I'm gonna go back to it. They grow faster than lions, for example. A lion male will only reach his full size or his full height when he's four, and only his full weight when he is about eight. 
Ah, now Gilly in Milwaukee, you are aware that these hyenas come into the camp and steal the dustbin every so often. And you want to know if these are the very ones, if these are the pilfering gang that come into the camp and steal the dustbin every so often. Gilly, I'd say almost without question, uh, there will be one of this lot that will come into the camp and steal our dustbin. And I'd say that only because we're pretty close to where we live and therefore we are definitely within the clan territory where we live at the DRC or Juma Research Camp. So yes, do I recognize the thief? No, I don't. You see, they come under cover of darkness when all is quiet and slumbering in the camp and then they drag them out. So were I an expert tracker, of course, we might be able to recognize the tracks of the pilfering hyena here. Hmm, be difficult to say. I suspect probably a young male. This is incredible. Is play behavior going on all over the place. It is the most wonderful scene here. That's interesting. Kevin Catfish, have I ever seen the kind of behavior that we witnessed earlier where it looked like the hyenas were in fact happy to see me? Um, Kevin, no, I don't think I have seen it before like that. That's the first time they've come rushing out to meet me. I actually thought they were leaving the den, that we'd arrived here just in time to see them leave. Um, were they happy? Yes, they were happy, but that's simply because they were curious. They enjoy the diversion, I think, that the vehicle produces in exactly the same way as a puppy or even a young human being enjoys the arrival of a stranger or a, a new thing that they're not particularly used to all the time. It provides them with some form of entertainment. And then, as you can see, they've lost interest pretty quickly. But just like any, any mammal. It is wonderful to spend this kind of time with them. They're all playing and having a good time. There's one behind me. I believe you keep losing the audio. Sorry about that. Dov, this thing is flashing red every so often. I think it's the one on my oh, hang on. Ah. The aerial seems to have come off entirely. Louise, I don't know if you can hear this, but uh, the aerial has detached. The aerial has detached from the microphone, which might need to be repaired. Can you hear me, Louise? One, two, testing. Okay, there we go. I think it's all right now. Them. That's interesting, Sharon. You want to know, do I think that because of the amount of time that we spend with these hyenas, that they are perhaps able to recognize individual voices, that they know who we are? Sharon, I'm sure they can recognize individual voices. Do they, did they come out because they knew it was me? No, I don't think so. Did they come out because they knew the vehicle was just an entertaining thing and they're used to it? Yes, I think that's precisely what happened. But I'm pretty sure that the sound of my voice is now completely familiar to them. Were you to bring someone else in with a slightly stranger voice, I think they'd notice the difference. Whether that would have any discernible effect on their behavior or not, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think I have a particularly um, different voice that the hyenas would react in a different fashion. This is just so special, these little things coming to say hello to us. Looking 
front there. There's an adult coming through. This is interesting. The little one's reacting quite differently to this one coming in here. Smelling in the holes. They're saying hello now. Also, I think, if I'm not mistaken, a male. All right, let's head across to Scott, get an update from him. And I think we're going to stay, spend a little bit longer here and just wait until things calm down because it is just so very special to be here. So, we are making our way up our eastern boundary and we've just come across some big male leopard tracks going the wrong way, going east. I wonder who it is. I wonder whose footprints these are. Possibly Gijima, who knows, maybe one of the brothers, Kunyuma or Quarantine, who we haven't seen for a long time. Either way, there's nothing we can do about that other than go and look for some other tracks that are coming onto our property or somewhere where we can actually follow them. But that is not a problem because we are on our way to go and find Genevieve's Mapani Beehive, which we are not too far away from. I hope I can remember exactly where it, where it is. But I don't think it should be too much of a problem. This leopard was lurking here somewhere yesterday afternoon. I saw his tracks leaving Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Sneaky leopard. Oh, uh, well. What can you do? Hello, Eddie Abbey. You'd like to know if there are any creatures called mango worms here in South Africa? Not that I know of. Um, not that I know of. We've definitely got many tasty mangoes. I'm not sure if we have the worms that go with them. But let us know about them, Eddie Abbey. Um, maybe they are called something else here. I do not know. Just going to call in these leopard tracks because they are going into an area where other people can drive around so that may be of some use or relevance to them. And cause of my daughter Ingwe head east towards pipeline out of Vuyatela, Chirikat line. Okay, so this is the road that the Mapani beehive is on. It is on a little fallen down log on the right hand side of the road, very close to the road. I just need to try and remember exactly where it was. <laughs> Hello, Annie in British Columbia. Uh, you would like to know if I've ever had a job where I had to wear a tie. And yes, there was a very short stint of my life when I left the, the Sabi Sands after working here for three and a half years. Um, and I temporarily got a job at a property auction house. And there I did have to wear, I didn't have to wear a tie every day, but I had to wear like a suit. Um, but when we did auctions, then I had to wear a tie. I hate ties. Um, so you're right. Uh, Annie says she, that I look like someone that is allergic to ties, and I am even having to go to, to weddings, which are obviously wonderful occasions having to get all dressed up and suffocate yourself with a tie is just senseless to me. 
especially in a lot of the climates where this has to be performed. In hot, hot, sweltering, humid climates, you have to knowingly just prepare for discomforts. That makes zero sense. This big male leopard must have been lurking somewhere close to the water hole yesterday where we had his tracks. His tracks are going along this road away from us here. Yeah? Go ahead, Johan. One of the other guys is trying to get a hold of me. Maybe he's got some good news. Please. No, he doesn't have good news. He just wants to know what's going on. Tracks of a uh, Mafazi Ingwe across south at Twin Dams. Tracks of my daughter Ingwe across east uh, to Pipeline, Chilikat Line. Nothing else, sadly. Oh, la, there is some other good news. I must tell him that James has found a new den site. Uh, apologies, I forgot James has relocated the new Nisikaya off Aubrey's Road. That's affirmative. Sneaky leopard. It couldn't have been Mvula. Mvula was seen yesterday somewhere on Cheetah Plains. When I initially saw this track yesterday, I thought, oh, maybe Mvula's come back to visit. He used to be the dominant male of this area, but he's not spending much time here anymore. Um, so who knows, maybe it's Kunyumo quarantine. Or oh, Bahuti. Maybe Bahuti. Another young male that we saw briefly, just once. We've seen him only once. Oh, uh, no, I'm not thinking, I'm not saying the right guy. Not Bahuti, I'm... Who's the other son? Shh, Makombo. Makombo is a young male who can lurk in these parts. James is uh, still at the den. I think he's fixed his tech issue, so we will be sending you straight back there. Toodle do. Well, we haven't moved at all, everyone. We've just been sat here and much more play behavior. Interestingly, Madam got up. She got a little irritated with one of the young males who's now, I think he's probably behind the vehicle. But she got up and she gave him a bit of a shout. She growled at him and then chased him and he ran past the front of the car. And then he sheepishly came back a little bit. And now he's kind of gone off and laying down somewhere. So she's the disciplinarian. She's very patient normally with most of the rest of the hyenas and even cubs that aren't her own, she's very patient with. But she wasn't going to put up with the male being a bully. And he was starting to get a little bit probably rough with the December Cubs. That one there playing, <laughs> playing on the stick. This is just too special. Ah. This gives one a sense that all is right with the world. We haven't got anywhere near the plan that I was going to do, which was to head along the northern boundary. It's been far too much fun here. <laughs> and seemingly like all young carnivores, just like your cats and your dogs at home, when they're little, they like to bite. Hello, Ellen Fowler. You want to know, the other den, of course, when we left there, was quite smelly, and you want to know if other creatures will go in there and clear the schmutz out. I haven't really heard the term schmutz before, um, but I think it's quite a good one. It encompasses everything that might be there. Um, Ellen, I don't think anything's going to go in there and clean it out, no. Would the den be occupied by other creatures? I don't think so. I think the smell will dissipate after a while. Certainly when I've visited the old dens, it will dissipate, but only after a few weeks. I think, Ellen, you'll find that the smell of hyena and perhaps the knowledge that they might be back is enough to deter just about anything except lions. 
So while that maybe a badger might go along there and have an investigation, I don't think they'd hang around there. And the schmutz, as you put it, could well be cleared out, will probably be cleared out by invertebrates. So, you know, dung beetles might go in there, and so might uh, various detritus-eating uh, creatures like uh, millipedes, or what else might there be? A whole lot of invertebrates that eat that sort of thing. Termites even might go in and have a go. And eventually, after a week or two, it'll stop smelling. The other thing that makes these dens smell, of course, is the anal pasting that the hyenas do. They walk around the termite mounds and they mark long grass stalks and long sticks with an anal gland. And that's a very potent smelling secretion that they make. And it's a very effective way of them marking the territory. And as I say, quite unlike a wild dog, which is very worried that the den should not be discovered by other predators, the hyenas, of course, are, if not at the top, second from the top of the predator hierarchy in this area. And the only thing that they worry about is lions. And as we saw, look at the beautiful pictures, the light comes out. As we saw the other day, when lion, if a lion was to walk into the scene, these cubs would disappear down into the holes. The lion would be unable to get down into the den to get them. The adults would just kind of melt off into the bush. That's the only thing they have to worry about. A leopard won't come near here. And nor will the wild dogs. I agree, Lisa, in Colorado. I think you're absolutely correct. The, it is amazing, and I'm constantly astounded by this, of course. The predator out here with the most powerful jaws, second only perhaps to the crocodile of Africa. And it is amazing to see them playing and they have such control over their jaw muscles. And you watch the adults kind of pulling each other's legs around and picking the cubs up. And there's, I mean, of course, they could snap each other's legs off with one bite if they wanted to. But they're just very gentle. And I mean, this was evidence the other day when we watched that amazing attack of 10 dogs on the hyena. The high dogs wanted nothing to do with the jaw of that hyena that they attacked. They were happy to bite her on the backside, but as soon as she could protect her backside, they wanted nothing to do with those jaws. Lindsay, in Texas, you want to know if, if it's unusual to see this many hyenas living together. Actually, Lindsay, this is quite a small clan, believe it or not. There's a much bigger clan living around Arethusa. I don't know how many... Um, hyenas are often at the den there. I think the den is actually on Elephant Plain, so we haven't actually seen it. But there's one at Londolozi that I was at recently, and there were, I think, about 10 adults at the den, not as many little ones as we have here. So there's actually quite a small clan. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, our viewers have identified 17 different adults in the clan. Uh, I know the Arethusa one. If I'm not mistaken, has got about 30 different adults within the clan that they've identified. So quite a small clan, but a very confiding one, and I think quite a tightly knit group, this one, led by Madam, whose two little, we think, male cubs are in full frame now. And often I think it is a little bit difficult for you to get perspective if you're watching the camera. Those puppies there, or cubs, are about the same size as, um, I'm just trying to think, dog-wise, dog they're probably the size of a, um, I guess, I'm gonna hate myself for saying this, they're about the same size as a schnauzer, those little ones, uh, a miniature schnauzer. The big hyenas are like the biggest dog you can get. I mean, a big female hyena weighs 70 kilos, it's about 160 pounds. And that'll give you an idea of the size we're looking at. And then I think it's Tom. You want to know lots of hungry mouths to feed. Do they help with the hunt? No. I will only accompany the rest of the clan on a hunt from between eight months and a year. Until then, they will suckle. They only wean around six months. That is the great advantage, of course, of being a mammal is that you don't have to necessarily bring food to your youngster. 
<laughs> Hello, Audrey. Audrey, you are age 10 and you are the daughter of Marjorie. You can just, I'm going to explain to you now. Just try and listen. And if you can hear that, it's another hyena calling. You want to know how on earth they build their home. Audrey, they don't build their home in, any, in the same way that you didn't build your home. Your home, of course, was built by builders, and so was this home built by builders. And the builders of this home were actually the original owners of the home, and they are the termites, the fungus-growing termite. Macrotermes is what his name is, his official name is. And millions and millions of them would have lived in this enormous mound and they would have built it out of sand and their own dung and their saliva. And over many, many years, possibly, possibly as many as 100 years, this termite mound would have got as big as it is now. And then, eventually, what would have happened, that the next person that came to live here, or the next animal that came to live here, would have been something called an artfark, which is also known as an ant bear. And that's an ant-eating animal with a long nose. And they have very powerful claws. The only kind of claws out here that are able to dig into a termite mound, they would have made the first holes. And then, after that, after the artifact had opened the thing up, then the hyenas would have moved in. So they're probably only the third or fourth owners of this little home, Audrey. Nice question. Thank you. These little chaps have seen something behind here. I'm just going to excuse my head as I look behind us. See what they've spotted. That's another hyena. I can hear another hyena behind us. I can't see one, but you can hear it going. Ooh. Well, Sabrina, you're 12. It's so wonderful having questions from our young naturalists. You want to know if will the hyenas not hurt themselves if they if they fall off the top of the den? No, you know, they're much tougher than, than human babies. You know, human babies are so fragile. But these little things, it's almost as soon as they're born, they're much stronger muscles, much stronger bones, much stronger ligaments. There's definitely something going on behind us. Dave, can you see anyone coming in? I just don't want to move because, of course, there are hyenas all over the place. So you'll have to put up with the aerial in your shot, I'm afraid. There's just a call from a hyena behind us going. Mm. There we go. Mm. I'm not sure which one is calling there. See, they are surrounding us all over. What is this adult who's calling? Looks like a young female to me. Might actually be pretty. You know, it's not. She's got, the, she's got a wound or a growth. <laughs> underneath her, her chin there. It's quite distinctive. But they all know her. An amazing sound. Sorry, everybody, I can't move. They're, I mean, they're right behind us, obviously, and uh, they're basically the only spot that I could move to. That's the aerial of the vehicle attached with a number of ropes, the roll bar. 
is just fantastic stuff to be surrounded by these spectacularly special animals. People often ask what our favorite animals are out here, and I think I'd have to say that wild dogs are my favorite, but these guys are a close second. Now, Kyle, you are in New York, and you're a South African, and you live in New York. Sorry about that, Kyle. Um, I'm a bit facetious, of course. You say that hyenas can recognize individuals, and you've got that information from a chap called Kim Wallace, who has done some amazing work with hyenas. Yes, I met Kim Wallace last year, actually, up in the Tooley Block, around where Pete's Pond is, basically, where you have that Pete's Pond pan dam cam there, Kim Wallace works around that area, and he apparently let me know through a medium of a documentary called, I think it's called Hyena Queen, that hyenas do recognize individuals and probably by scent. That's interesting. Thank you, Kyle. I think you've, um, I mean, if, if Kim reckons that that is the case, I have no reason to doubt it. He's certainly a highly accomplished man and has done a lot with hyenas. I just, the only thing that I would say about that in this context, Kyle, is that this vehicle is a very smelly thing. And I wonder how much of our individual scent they're able to get over the smell of the fuel and the brake fluid and the, you know, the rubber and the kind of fumes that come off here. I know Kim did a lot of his stuff um, on foot at a hyena den. And... I mean, I think he still keeps a daily blog, and I know he's been spending time with a hyena that's got it's totally crippled on the back legs. I don't know if the hyena's still alive. But for months and months, he spent time at a den with a hyena that was totally crippled. And I think he was, I think he was sitting at the den at one stage. So it'd be well worth checking him out. Or Google him, and you'll find his, his blog. He writes a very comprehensive daily blog. Thanks, Kyle. So they're all kind of wandering about a little wider now from the den. And you'll notice as soon as there's an adult a bit further away from the den, so the cubs will have the confidence to go back down and play a bit further afield. But the little ones have now gone back inside, probably to sleep. sitting on the rear tire. Mm -hmm. David, I have you prepared to bed down for quite some time. There's one just popped out right underneath the vehicle. That will be D1. White foot. <laughs> Hello, Simon. A nice question from you about why it is that some hyenas are dark in colour and others not when they're from the same clan. Um, well, first of all, they're born dark, obviously, and then they get lighter, like the one walking away there, and they get the sort of brown spotting or uh, black spotting. Then they do seem to show some kind of variation. Now, I don't think that there's any difference between, you know, the different human beings have different colored hair i think it's the same with hyenas uh, certainly some do seem to be darker than others the variation is obviously a lot less than it is with human beings but we have different skin tones i mean even amongst people of the same race you will have different skin tones i think it's the same with hyenas they have different hair colors different skin tones and some of them will just be darker and some of them will just be lighter and i don't think there's anything uh, particularly in it obviously within an area um, yeah, you probably have a bit more uniformity than you might between areas. But, uh, you know, there's just a variation. I don't think that there's anything more to it than that, to be honest. All right, I think that it's probably time to move on from here, see what else we can find. Everyone is going to sleep. Hmm. Sarah, just before we leave, do you want to know how 
old they will be before they're able to recognize the alarm calls of other animals. Sarah, I have to confess that I wouldn't have the faintest clue. I'm going to guess that because they start moving with the clan at around eight months, that it's probably around then that they start to learn that. I suspect quite strongly it's a learned behavior or the ability to recognize alarm calls and respond to them as a learned kind of behavior. And so when they start moving with the clan at eight months, I think that's probably when they start to discern the different alarm calls. All righty, let's head across to Scott. We're going to try and extricate ourselves from here. Uh, let's find out what he's got. I think he's got some um, beefalo. So, good fun at the hyena den. Awesome stuff. Look at all these buffalo ahead of us. There is a wall of buffalo. They all seem to be snoozing. There's a lot more to the left of these ones on the road. It's just that genre is showing the most clearly visible ones. James, just to let you know, I have checked uh, all the boundaries up to Gauri Cutline, Buffalo Cutline, I'm just a little bit west thereof with this breeding herd of buffalo. Just giving Dave, uh, sorry, James, some updates. Okay, copy. As to what the plans are, or where I've checked at least. All different shaped and sized buffalo amongst this breeding herd. And what a beautiful scene this is. Sun's just poked out from behind the cloud for a moment. It seems like it's disappearing again. And who knows what kind of a night they had. Were you guys chased around by any lions? Yes? No? Okay. They are all very, very intent on us. Blank stares coming from all of them. You'll be glad to know, Buffalo, that we have got no sign of lion anywhere near you, so I think you are safe. But I wouldn't be hugely disappointed if I was wrong. Now, a breeding herd of buffalo is essentially a large herd that is run by females. The females, of which you are mainly looking at females here, especially the adults, and they will make the decisions as to where the herd moves. There are going to be some big males that follow the herd, hoping to get some mating opportunities. But it's a female-oriented society, this, with the males just lurking in the shadows, really. One individual looks like it's interested in us. Come on, you can come closer. Considering we had an elephant pushing and touching the vehicle yesterday, we won't mind if you come a little bit closer than you are. We'll be able to handle that, I think. And for anyone who wasn't on the sunset safari yesterday, we had the most remarkable sighting with a massive elephant bull. And I'd never experienced that in my all my years of guiding, having an elephant come up to the vehicle and actually rest its tusks and trunks on the hood of the vehicle initially. And then on the second attempt, he came up and was touching the side of the car where my door is frighteningly close to a gigantic beast, but very, very fond memories. He was inquisitive. There was never any aggression. Um, but of course, when there's that much body being inquisitive, about six tons of it probably in total, it got the blood pumping. Thank you for all of those uh, to who did the uh, wonderful
kind of screenshots of where you superimposed myself in front of the hood of the vehicle, as well as the elephants, to give a size comparison. And it's frightening how big they are. It gives, a, gives you guys a good example of exactly how big they are when you can compare it to, to me. So thank you for all of those who did that. James has found a spider web. Off you go. Right, David has spotted a David. Look at that. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? It's a little spider in a, an orb spider. It's tiny. It's probably its web is about the size of my hand. I'll just actually, Dave, I'm going to put my hand. There's my hand. So you can see the size of the little web. But as Dave, you see how he pulled the focus there? It must be totally impossible for something to see as it's flying along at breakneck speed as an, as an insect. And suddenly, as you come to within the sort of focal range of your eyes, bang, you're in it. I don't know what kind of spider it is. It looks a little bit like a kite spider to me. It might be one of the kite spiders. Hundreds of different spider species. All righty. Well, we just want to quickly show you that. Uh, let's go back to the breeding herd of buffalo. We're just leaving the hyena den now. We'll catch up with you later. So this is a young bull. You can see already the sensor of his horns beginning to create a crown-like structure. If Jeanne just pans across to the left, we'll be able to show you some others. You see, this is a female. There we go. That's a perfect comparison between a young bull we you can see that crown developing and the female who's behind him to the left. So a good comparison between a young bull and some females. I'm only seeing other old females here, no big bulls. This is Another good example of a female that Jeanre is zooming in on now. She's giving us a serious death stare. You don't trust us, old lady. Fear not. We come in peace, and there are no lions hiding behind us. Got one of my very, very good friends, Brett Hawley, watching in a town nearby, the closest town to us, Hoodsprate. And I'll be going and staying with him on either Sunday or Monday for a week or so when Nikki and I leave. Brett, hello. And I hope you are enjoying yourself. Of course, a lot of you will remember Brett, so I'm not piecing the puzzle together here. I'm half asleep still. And a lot of you will remember Brett, of course, from the interview drives that he did not so long ago. So happy to know you're watching, Brett, and I hope all is well in Hoots, Brett. We will see you soon. But, but his brother in the local language Afrikaans. Another interesting term that we use here in South Africa is China. We say, how's it, China? which I don't think is used in other countries. I don't know how on earth us South Africans started using that as a phrase for, like, brew, I guess. You can say China. Anyway, we're going down a slippery slope here, considering we are in a buffalo sighting. Look at that one is drooling. <laughs> Looks like he's got a strange kind of horn formation, the one that was drooling. Is it all this fresh green grass after the rains that's getting you excited? Hard to tell. Ah, now Luciferia is one of the newer safari goers would like to know what would happen if they charged us. It, it's a good question. Jandre and I would probably have a heart attack. Um, it would be very terrifying. Oh, that one's doing a bit of a Fleming grimace, which basically means it's opening up a scent organ which allows it to better process smell. What was exciting it, I'm not sure. Maybe it's the rear end of that female. 
Yeah, it looks like that's the case. It may do another phlegm and grimace. After that, little sniff. There we go. Ooh, does that smell good? So who knows what exactly the smells are that it is processing, but that is called the Fleming Grimace. We'll see the lions doing it from time to time. A lot of the mammals out here will perform that maneuver. He's obviously possibly a young inquisitive boy. And maybe one of these females is coming into season. Hard to be certain. Sorry, Lucifer, you were wondering what would happen if they would charge us. I mean, it's highly, highly unlikely that they would charge us in, in the vehicle. They may stampede past us if lions are chasing them, but then naturally they are going to want to get past us and not get stuck into the hood of the vehicle because then the lions will be able to jump onto their backs. On foot, though, these breeding herds can be quite inquisitive when you come across them, and they can come up to you and investigate, but it's usually not in an aggressive nature. Again, if you were on foot and a pride of lions started chasing buffalo and they stampeded towards you, then you, you would be in trouble. I mean, they're going to possibly trample you, but again, their main motive is going to be to get away from the lion. Buffalo that will charge you in a more aggressive nature will typically be the older bulls that are alone. You don't usually come into trouble with these larger breeding herds, which is thankful because it would be a terrifying scenario to be in. Hello, Deborah, who is another South African viewer watching from Gauteng. I hope all is well there, Deborah. You're interested to know how exactly do uh, this herd, or well, how does this herd, rather, of buffalo decide where to go and when? And I'm not sure who worked this out, but apparently it's the females. The older females within the herd, how many of them? It will obviously depend on each and individual herd. But it's the old ladies that are called pathfinders that will decide where to go and when. How and when they have these discussions and who is the queen of the herd, I'm not too sure. I've never been able to work that out. But that is what the experts say. It would be very inter interesting to understand the dynamics. I mean, of course, just like uh, any large group of animals, for a few animals to be making decisions on behalf of them, even they might, may have some disagreements. One lady say, may say, let's go to this water hole today, and another one may say, no, I think we should go this way, there's better food there. So I'm sure they do have some heated debates amongst themselves when deciding what to do, because naturally it's not always an easy decision. And I guess that's why sometimes large herds of buffalo will fragment. You may find this herd, which well, I'm guessing maybe there's a hundred or so here, may have joined up with other herds, up to a thousand animals strong. Would be a very large herd of buffalo. Looks like some of them are actually thinking of moving, but some are on the right of the road, others appear to be moving to the south, to the left of the road. Simon, you would like to know if these are diseased-free buffalo. And no, they are not. They have all got bovine tuberculosis. All of the buffalo in the Kruger National Park are in that same predicament. It's not a huge issue, but there are populations of disease-free buffalo which are being bred in South Africa that go for frighteningly large amounts of money. I heard a terrible story for a for a local disease-free buffalo farmer. I think one of his staff members forgot to turn on the water pump and the buffalo herd of 150 disease-free buffalo got no water. And they, on average, are valued at about $10,000 per animal, maybe slightly less than that. But your average female will be that expensive. So when there's 150 of them that die in one sitting, you obviously have a very horrible morning for that farmer. Huh. I'm not sure 
if that worker is still employed there anymore. Probably not. <laughs> oh, here's a big old boy. So this is a good example to show you a crown of horn. Look at that. Oh, he is a monster, and it looks like he's trying to get quite amorous with the ladies here. I hope Sarah is watching, because she was hoping to see these animals mating or inquiring as to why we haven't seen any of them mating. And it's simply because we don't get to see these herds very often. It's not uncommon in these sightings to have males mounting females. And maybe that's going to happen right now with this big old boy. Hello, Tony Croc. Um, you are wondering whether these buffalo are food for people. Um, certainly in various parts of Africa, buffalo will be fed on. Um, but none of the animals in the Kruger National Park are used to feed people, even though they could be. They are used to feed lions and the other predators of this area. And basically, all of the wild animals can be, can be fed on, well, especially the ones that you, you look at like this and think, well, that looks like a cow. That could be eaten. Look at these beautiful dark clouds in the background. What an awesome scene this is. I just latched out to try and catch a little moth, but I didn't have any luck. It was called a Burnett's moth, a beautiful uh, bright red and kind of emerald green glistening insect. So happy to see that they've emerged again. This is, will, will be their third emergence this summer. There was an in, initial emergence, then they disappeared, then there was a secondary emergence, and now this is the third time I've seen one after a, a big gap in between. Which, fa which fascinates me. I mean, how these insects decide when to emerge after which rainfall and the fact that there's always staggered kind of emergences of various insects, sometimes the reproductive termites. Oh, Jandre, it's landed on your arm. Pass here. Obviously, it'll be difficult for Jandre to film it while it is on his arm. So I've just scooped it off. And I'm going to wait for Jandre to zoom in before I do the reveal. Okay, we are ready for action. This might be quick. Look at that. Awesome, and off it goes. Wow, wasn't that lucky, hey? Jandre, what uh, cologne or soap do you use, or none of it? No? Buffalo pat. Buffalo pat. Jandre says he just rubs a little bit of buffalo pat behind his ears, and that tends to attract the moths. <laughs> Look at this one cow, it's absolutely awesome. She doesn't trust, I don't know, I mean, whether she doesn't trust me or Jandre or both of us, she just is looking at us like we are up to no good. Oh, I'm very happy to hear that my favorite band, Coldplay, is tuned into the live safari again this morning. I hope uh, you guys are doing well and are wondering when you're going to come and perform next year in South Africa. Only kidding. Hello, Coldplay. And you're right. I mean, this lady really does not like the look of us, but she's finally... No, she hasn't given up just yet. One last over the shoulder there. Sorry, I don't know what it is we've done wrong, but we come in peace. Oh, cute. There's a little calf crossing the road. It's a... Tiny little youngster, look at that. Cute. And a young, young buffalo may be born at any time of the, the year. They don't have a set breeding season. There are sometimes seasonal peaks where buffalo will give birth during the rainy seasons, but that's not cast in stone. So you'll generally, when viewing these large herds of buffalo, see youngsters of all varied shapes and sizes. Well, that's a Kevin Catfish who's realized there's an important component missing from the scene. Oxpeckers. 
But as you say that, Kevin, I can hear some. They may be literally flying on their way in. Fascinating that there's not one here. I mean, they would have been active by now for quite some time, the oxpeckers. So how they haven't found this massive buffet of buffalo, which will provide countless ticks and parasites for them to feed on, I don't know. Maybe these guys are just incredibly well maintained and don't have a high parasite load and the oxpick has already come here, had a look and moved on. But that is a very good observation, Kevin, so thank you for pointing that out. Now, I have got some good news. The buffalo are heading on to Juma. That is exactly what we want. And I'm guessing that if they continue in the direction they're moving in, they are going to pop out at the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. And it shouldn't take them too long to do that. Not the Buffalo's Hook waterhole, this the Juma Dam Cam. Apologies. I've been distracted by a little funny moth. It's in front of us here, Jandre, and I'm not too sure what it is. Um, somewhere in there. You see, oh, nice, Jandre, straight in on it. Look at that. It almost looks kind of similar to the Burnett moth that we saw a little bit earlier. Let's reposition, get you a better view. Yes, Buffalo, you can all run straight into Juma. Don't be alarmed, though, making us look bad. Oh, that is pretty. I may need to roll backwards or forwards to get Jandra into the right spot. Where has it gone? Oh, it's disappeared. Just it. You got it? Oh, well done. Well done. Oh, no! It's going to... But it's in another... There we go. Look at how awesome this is. I haven't seen one of these this summer. Look at those little markings on its head. Fascinating. So I'm going to leave this one up to you guys to try and identify for us. Thank you very much. One of you guys have updated us on that the Burnett moth should be called the Christmas, mo Christmas moth because it looks like a Christmas decoration on this one too. And that was Zoomy Mike. Cool, so if you guys don't mind trying to work out who that moth was, it'll be wonderful if we can piece that puzzle together. And we're going to continue now, leave these buffalo heading towards the Juma Dam Cam. They could pop up there in about 20 minutes or half an hour if they continue moving. And we are going to send you to James for an update. There is a pretty, pretty look at the sun peeping up over a big grey cloud, which unfortunately will probably be burnt into oblivion by the sun by the time 11 o'clock rolls around. Now, I'm stopped here not only for the sun, we stopped just next to where we think Gijima probably made a kill about three days ago. It's in a tree in this thicket. We're not even going to bother to turn the camera towards it because there's nothing there. Well, the kill is in the tree. You can just kind of see it. But I was just hoping to see a glimpse of this leopard, this male leopard with his spots maybe sparkling a little bit through the undergrowth, but I can see nothing in there. But it is a good idea. He's a nervous fellow, obviously he doesn't like cars very much. And it's always a good idea just to drive slowly past here. I'm sure he's around here somewhere. He'll be watching us. Just drive slowly past so that he gets used to the sound of the vehicles. He gets used to the fact that we're not a threat. It's interesting, there's some alarming there. Maybe he's that side. We'll move in there quickly now. Let's just go and have a look. Um, and also, a good idea is to sit around where a leopard is so that he realizes there's no threat. And then eventually, with any luck, he'll habituate. See those birds there shouting? They might be just shouting at each other. They're long-tailed magpie shrikes. I think they're just shouting at each other. They're on the ground there now. Not too terrified. There's one here, Dave. Hello, Kyle. While we're looking at these um, 
magpie shrikes or that magpie shrike. You want to know if there are any mammals that don't move in groups or packs? Plenty, Kyle, lots of them. Of the carnivores, the cheetah and the leopard are the most obvious ones. There he goes. Let's sneak a little bit forward here. So those two are the most obvious, Kyle. But then also you get things like um, African wild cats, servals, black-footed cats, uh, white-tailed mongoose. Uh, what else would be? I'm just thinking of the carnivores at this stage. So those would be the carnivores that live on their own, Kyle. And then what you find with the herbivores is the smaller they get, the more likely they are to live on their own. So, because they don't want to be seen, and it's um, it's a disadvantage for them to be in a herd. So, Stienbok or a Dika, a Sunni, a Dik Dik, all of these small antelope will be on their own. They will often be within kind of visual range of a, a partner, a female or a male, depending on which they are. Uh, but then they might share a territory, but they'll seldom be with them, um, you know, walking around grazing together or grooming each other. That's normally just normally just on their own and that's because they don't want to be obvious they want to hide as much as possible from anything that might want to eat them. I don't think these uh, shrikes are shouting at anything in particular so we're going to carry on down Mbubu Road the road that leads to the Juma Dam Pan the squat has covered the rest of the boundary so we've checked this part of the boundary here to see if anything has come in uh, we were hoping maybe to get a glimpse of Gijima the leopard Unfortunately, he did not. I think he's probably around there still. Although, I wonder, you know, there were the hyena in that area, and there were, there was a wild dog there yesterday morning. But I wonder, perhaps, if they haven't frightened him off, or whether he hasn't thought, you know what, I'm, I'm a good enough hunter to have my dinner undisturbed. I'm going to put something else to eat. Excuse the bumping. We go through here. and um, close to Tacoma. I'm not sure where that is. It sounds like an interesting spot to live. Um, Lisa, first of all, you say you're not sure if this is a stupid question. It is absolutely not a stupid question. In fact, there are very few stupid questions in the world. Um, there are plenty of stupid answers, as I've said before. I've given many of them. Um, Lisa, you want to know, because of the drought and the fact that the migratory birds are perhaps not having as good a time as they might during a normal season of rain, are they likely not to come back again? Are they likely to think, uh, South Africa is actually not for me, let's go somewhere else next year? Lisa, no, I don't think that's likely to be the case at all. I think that their migratory patterns are so hardwired into their bodies that I don't think that they are would be actually able to make that decision, A, and B, where else would they go? So they would have to leave. So if we just take the obvious example of a swallow. A swallow will have to leave Europe to come down to the south because there's nothing to eat there in the winter. Now the whole of southern Africa where the swallows live is experiencing a drought. So while I think the major effect is probably going to be that, watch your heads everybody, the major effect is probably going to be that the swallows are going to have a reduced arrival back in Europe. I think that the fact that the fewer, there are so many fewer insects than normal is going to mean that they haven't eaten as much, their fat reserves won't be as good, which means that fewer of them are going to make that big trek. 8,500 kilometers, as pointed out by Gerda yesterday evening. Uh, so thank you very much for that, Gerda. You tweeted that to me. It was very kind. 8,500 kilometers, 32 days it takes them to get there. And I think you'll find that few of them are going to make that trip because of their lack of fat reserves. They'll all try and make it, but some of them are going to fall by the wayside as they go. Next year, they're going to have to come back. They don't really have a choice. So even if they could make that cognitive decision, I don't think they would. So I think that's a really clever question, actually. Thank you very much for that. We're just gently moving down here, checking around if there aren't any tracks. Oh, Marjorie, 
see this is a slippery slope you're expecting me to go down here. Um, you say you know we don't interfere with nature, but if we found an abandoned small baby animal that tugged at the heartstrings, would we leave it to die, which sounds like a tremendously heartless thing to do, or rescue it, which sounds like a very humane thing to do? Marjorie, I'm afraid by and large we would leave it. And essentially that would be, yes, leaving it to die. That would be a difficult decision to make. It wouldn't be easy at all, but there are a few reasons for it. First of all, if it was, say, a lion cub, yes, you can handle a lion cub when it weighs 120 grams. You can feed it milk and give it a fortified porridge during the course of the day. But eventually, it's going to go into a 200 kilogram lion. Now, while we most certainly wouldn't be able to handle that here, yes, you could send it to a rehabilitation center, but I mean, what kind of life is that? Very seldom are lions actually successfully reintroduced to wild areas, unless they are on very small reserves where there are no other lions. And nine times out of 10, these things end in tragedy. If you raise an animal by hand, it loses its fear of human beings. And the number of lions, I mean, even George Adamson, who was an expert at this sort of thing, eventually had to shoot one of his favorite lions because it was just not afraid of people and eventually it killed a person. So, with a lion you wouldn't, would, what, would, would we take a baby impala if we found it? Again, no. Would we raise it? Yes, possibly. Would we want it to go into a rehab center? Uh, I don't think so. I'm not convinced that that, while they certainly serve a purpose, I'm not convinced that it's necessarily the best long-term life. And it normally ends in tragedy. Again, if you try and reintroduce a wild animal to the wild, it doesn't know how to live in the wild. So in the long term, I often think it's crueler to try and rescue a baby animal as opposed to just leave it to the fate that nature has unfortunately ordained for it. I hope that answers your question, Marjorie. That's not to say that it isn't horribly difficult if we find an animal that is in distress or a youngster that has lost its mother. It's not to say that it isn't really, really difficult to be able to say, you know, we're just going to let it go. Thank you, Marjorie, for sending me down that slippery slope this morning. Right, let's head down the Bubu Road here, and then we'll head sort of towards the central region. We that herd of buffaloes hanging around, largely, of course, because it will probably attack some lions. Now, Safari guest, you are interested in white lions, and you say you watch a documentary on them in the Kruger area, and do we get them here? No, we don't get them here. I've never seen a white lion here. In fact, I've never seen a white lion, but... There are two areas in South Africa where, or in the Kruger area, where there seem to be, where that recessive and very rare gene seems to be carried and therefore expressed every so often. The one is around the Lobombo concession, which is mm, sort of northeast of where we are here, around the middle of the Kruger Park, and then the other is just further west of that, in the Timbavati. That's where the original white lions were found back in the early 70s by a chap called George McBride, if I'm not mistaken. It may have been George, may have been Robert, may have been someone else, but his name was Chris, Chris McBride, that's what it was. And Chris McBride wrote a story or a book called The White Lions of the Timbavati, and I think that that same population probably seeded the, uh, the new one um, around the Lobombo Mountains, uh, or Swaney far eastern fringes of the Kruger National Park, but I've never seen them here, no. Here is the old entrance to the old den to which we shall not go, because we do know that our hyenas don't live there anymore. We'll be interested eventually to see the scarback female. Ever run out of petrol or gas on drive? Um, no, I haven't actually. And 
that's largely because I'm not sure why I've done it. I've done it in my own private car a few times, especially as a student when you're trying to eke out the small amount of fuel that you put in your car. Um, in fact, embarrassingly often that that's happened to me. But no, not in game drive. I think if, I'm not sure how I've managed to avoid it, but I'm normally quite careful about it. <laughs> On that note, let's head across to Scott. Just heard, I think, some zebra alarm calling. I'm just listening for a second to see if I wasn't imagining things. It could have been a hornbill. The, the noise is a, a fairly similar frequency. No, Joy. Joe, uh, no, I've never run out of uh, fuel with guests, but I have been stuck, uh, very badly stuck before. Um, to a point where you have to wait for another vehicle to maybe come and pull you out or altogether you leave that vehicle because you need a tractor to come and pull you out. So I've been terribly stuck. Um, we haven't experienced uh, the, the issues of a rainy summer. Even last summer it was hardly rainy uh, and this summer drought. So usually the, the, the summer rainy season is, is the, the, the season of getting stuck. You tend to find that younger guides get more stuck than senior guides because they don't know the soil types, they try and push the boundaries a little bit too much, so I like to think that I wouldn't get stuck too much now. But uh, early on in the career that did happen quite a lot. Um, then I worked at a camp in Tanzania that had the worst fleet of vehicles ever, um, and they often broke. The one morning, the one vehicle broke on its way from the garages to the turning circle um, where you'd pick up the guests. Thankfully, the camp wasn't full, so we had another vehicle um, that managed to drive around the vehicle that was broken down on the way to pick up the guests. And we picked up the guests, drove a kilometer, and that vehicle broke down as well. So then we did a walk because we had no more vehicles. <laughs> so we didn't walk straight back to camp. We had a very cool morning, but I've had a few breakdowns before, um, but no, never have I run out of fuel. That would be inexcusable. But a worse offense, worse than running out of fuel, is oversleeping, and that I did once. It was bad. I went to sleep in a friend's room, a male friend's room, after a big party and nobody expected me to be in there so they searched all the ladies rooms and the staff camp couldn't find me and essentially didn't know what to do and then i was 45 minutes late for my drive another guide ended up taking my guests out and i was severely punished for that offense so i didn't make that mistake again <laughs> When I woke up to the banging on the door and they eventually worked out that I was in this guy's room, it was horrible. Vertical, rubbing of eyes, running towards Land Rover, racing to pick up guests, and it was winter. So it's very, very dry and dusty. And as I turned around a corner to go to the deliveries uh, entrance where I was expecting to find my tracker where we would have to load the the cooler box and all the drinks and snacks for, for, for the morning drive. Um, as I went down that deliveries exit, the, the guests, my guests came past with their new guide and I, a cloud of dust from the speed I was traveling at then proceeded to cover their whole vehicle. So it just added petrol to the fire. That camp was extremely expensive. I think people are paying uh, about $2,000 a night per person. Um, so they don't want their guide to be late. <laughs> Whoops. Thank you very much for the research that some of you guys have done. Siberia Zumi and Craig Brandy, who have said that it looks like that little moth we saw earlier was a tiger moth. 
I think was the name. But a scarlet tiger moth. But you're saying that it's lacking a few white spots. Um, so maybe a variation thereof. Thank you very, very much for that. I do have a butterfly and moth book back at camp, so I'll have a check at that. Okay. Ah, well, well done. It sounds like the myth has been busted by Maggie, Alina, and a few others whose names I haven't caught, but you know who you are, so thank you very, very much for uh, sending through that update. And it is, if, in fact, a false tiger moth. There we go. Bit of teamwork, and the myth has been busted in record timing. So thank you so much for that. Isn't it wonderful that we can all share one another's knowledge and skill and research? on this live safari, thus make learning, thus making the learning experience fun, quick, and effective. False tiger moth, boom. That is awesome. So thank you again. That is so, so cool that you guys went out of your way to help us. Hello, Jack. You're wondering on about any good websites, I think, to check up on spiders. And no, I don't know any good websites for spider research in Southern Africa. Um, so I cannot help you there. Um, Stefan's just come back with a spider book that is incredibly in depth. It's a new addition to the South African bookshelves. So I don't know what the name of that book is, sadly, and even if I did, I, I don't think I can tell it to you um, due to the rules of engagement here regarding what we can show and can't show regarding labeling. Um, but, but, but have a, a search uh, on any kind of book websites for the South African spiders and, and see what you come up with. That may be a, a better bet than, than the websites. Sydney's Waterhole. Seems to have one or two hippopotami in it. From a distance, James's crocodile will be hiding in there as well, I'm guessing. Wonderbar. Hello, Dan in Wisconsin. You would like to know what is the likelihood of coming into trouble whilst on a bushwalk and into trouble with specifically a snake? I don't think there, there's much chance of, of being bitten on, on a bushwalk. I think uh, increased likelihood compared to being on the vehicle. But out of all of the bushwalks that I've done and all of my colleagues have done, I've never heard of anyone being bitten by a snake. Um, usually your guide will be in front and usually that's where the danger comes from. So I'm sure that most guides with uh, the required level of skill will be able to see a snake that's in, in, the, in the pathway. Um, you know, the most likely snake to probably bite you on a bushwalk would be something like a puff adder, the little snake that we saw earlier on drive. And the reason for that is they are quite lethargic, sluggish snakes and they will give you warning. That's why they are called the puff adders. They will huff and puff. <laughs> so if you hear a hissing noise, um, you know, and again, that's why situational awareness, and that's why I say if your guide is uh, well-trained, look at these flies. I'm gonna stop trying to get rid of them. They just leave it there. Hello. The flare of my nostrils in excitement. It's too. If you can go in, if you wanna park, if you wanna park in my garage, you can. Oh, a pearl-spotted owlet is calling. Oh, it's ticklish. Ooh. <laughs> ah! Oh, okay, it was all I could handle. The bird you can hear. There's a tiny little owl. Let's go back and see if we can't find it. 
It's on the wrong side of the road, but we may be able to poach a view of it. Oh. Um, so as I was saying, though, the puff adders um, are a snake that could bite you, but they will often warn you and hiss and puff before you get too close to them. If you don't hear that huffing and puffing, well, then I guess that's your fault. The puff adder did try and warn you. And again, that's why at least if you're being taken around by somebody who knows what they're doing, then the chances of getting into trouble are slim. Well, I'm just going to be looking for a tiny little blob perched in a bush here, which may turn out to be the owl we're looking for. It's a gamble. I'm not too f sure how far in the noise is coming from. And because they are such tiny, tiny owls, it could be very easy to overlook them if they were behind a clump of leaves or just the wrong angle. We'll creep forward one more time, see if we don't get lucky. Failing that, we will be sending you back to Mr. James Henry so you can keep an eye on his movements. Okay, no joy with the pearl spotted eyelet, maybe next time. So off to James and we'll see you later. Now I feel like just taking a bit of a chance here, everyone, because we're in, in the kind of area where you might find a pearl spotted owl. Let. Let's see if we can call one. Now we listen. Very seldom have I managed to call one here. And a stony and slightly embarrassing silence follows. No pearl spotted owlet. But you can hear lots of other birds calling. There's a bit of a bird party going on, I think, in the drainage line here. So what we'll do is we're going to drive along the rest of this road and then go into the drainage and along and see if we can't spot some of those birds and perhaps sign of a leopard. Hang on. on the metric on this imperial system versus the metric one and you say you're not being rude of course you're not uh, but you want to know why i think it's better uh, but look i don't think it's better necessarily i just think it's easier everything is in multiples of 10 and we all know that our multiple our 10 times table is by far the easiest times table to remember i mean the fact that let's take distance for an example we have millimeters 10 millimeters uh, go into a centimeter, a hundred centimeters or a thousand millimeters go into a meter, uh, a thousand meters go into a kilometer. And so it's all just kind of nicely divided up. Now, if we go into the imperial system, we've got an inch, 12 inches in a foot, um, then you've got, how, I don't even know what a yard is. I think a yard is three feet, if I'm not mistaken, three feet. And then I have no idea how many feet go into a mile, but it's not an even number. And so when you start dividing and adding and subtracting things from each other, it becomes extremely difficult. Let's go to weight. You've got a gram in the metric system. Multiply that by a thousand, you have a kilogram. And if so it goes, a ton is a thousand kilograms. So it's all done in very neat multiples of either a hundred or 10 or a thousand. We go to the imperial system, we have ounces. I'd have no idea what an ounce is, uh, but to say that I know that it doesn't divide equally into a pound, which in turn doesn't divide equally or multiply equally into uh, 
whatever the next unit was, a stone, for example. I mean, a stone? Really? The one real advantage, though, of the imperial system is that it gives you the most incredible ability, I think, with mental arithmetic. And my father, of course, grew up with the with the imperial system and then moved on to in South Africa to the metric system. But his ability to do mental maths is quite astonishing, and I'm pretty sure it comes from the fact that throughout his childhood he was dealing with pounds and shillings and pence, which, uh, I mean, that's just beyond the realm of my capabilities. So that, Theresa, in a nutshell, is why I think it's just easier to operate off the metric system. And, I mean, temperature is another great example. Celsius is very simple. Water freezes at zero. Water freezes at zero, and it boils at 100. What could be more simple than that? And then Fahrenheit, water freezes at 32. 32? Why 32? And it boils. I don't even know what the boiling point of water is in Fahrenheit. Anyway, that's why I think the metric system is just easier to understand. I, can't, I quite understand that uh, many don't feel the same way, and I suppose it's what you've grown up, what you've grown up with. That's the most obvious thing. Right, a little boat trip. Let's see if we can spot some birds. And of course, the joy of these boat trips is that the car drives itself. Pretty much. Until it doesn't, and then you have an accident. Baba Bui. <laughs> I'm Baba Bui. I'm not laughing at your question. I'm laughing at your name. It's a wonderful Twitter handle, Baba Bui. Baba Bui, you want to know if we get gorillas in the Sabi Sands? No, we don't. We don't get gorillas or chimpanzees this far south in Africa. You find them only in forested areas, deeply forested areas. So even though we're driving through quite a thick area here, it's not nearly wet enough. It's not near, the trees are nearly big enough to support gorillas. So the countries in Africa where you'd find gorillas would all be found on that kind of central band of forest. Uh, you'd find them in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Congo Brazzaville. Uh, you'd find them in Uganda, the uh, western fringes of Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi maybe. Um, where else would you find them? I think those are the major countries where you'd find them. Uh, may, of course, you also find them in Gabon. And in the same place, you'll find chimpanzees. you find them all over those areas. But here, it's much too dry. The trees don't ever get big enough. I don't think they ever did occur this far south. In fact, I'm 90% sure that they did not. Thank you, Baba Bui, for that question. I was hoping for a bit more bird life along this particular section. Oh well, it's still very pleasant driving underneath the trees, listening, trying to spot a leopard, spotted pillar in amongst the dappled shade. I'm sure, like I said yesterday, I'd remember what a leopard looked like, to be honest. Dr. Anrak, you want to know if there's a GPS map of where we are? Dr. Anrak, um, or is it top secret? It's definitely top secret, Dr. Anrak. We couldn't tell you where we are. Um, this particular area is uh, completely sealed off from the world, top secret. No, all you need to do is go to Google Maps, and interestingly, actually, I don't know how this is the case, but if you go to Google Maps and you Google Juma, the roads that we drive on are actually labeled there. They aren't on the I think cheap planes are also labeled on Google Maps. But if you go to Google Maps, it's exactly where we are. Um, we don't have it. We, we've got an internal point so that the final control can tell where we are on the reserve. Perhaps we, you know, if we peak or something like that. But, but you could certainly, uh, it's not available to you, but you can absolutely go into the reserve, see the road names that we talk about and all that sort of thing. Google Maps is your most obvious call there. Right, what's the aerial here, David? Nasty overhanging.
hanging branchy. Signal's a bit dodgy right here. Let's start going. Who's driving? I am. Don't worry. I'm still here. Hello. Apologies for the breakup and signal on your riverbed cruise with James, but that is the risk of being in the low lying reaches of the Muwati. I hope he gets lucky and finds something in there. But some, I don't know what it is about riverbeds, but they really do just excite me. I guess maybe because of the beauty of the, the, the surroundings. If you do find something, it's always going to be a quality sighting. We have found a very pretty bird that is, is perched up here on this dead knobthorn tree. Sadly, the sun is just disappeared behind another cloud, which is going to make it difficult for Jeanne to make this European roller look as impressive as it does in the sunshine. Well, there seems to be not long tail trikes are making a racket here. Let's go and see what they're up to. I'm not sure if they're just having a group discussion. Some lap wings also took off just a moment ago from the same area. So Maybe there is reason for the animals to be panicking here. It's just somewhere, John has just showed you where the, the, the bird flew, flew off from. The lapwings flew off from the other side of the tree. Uh, maybe I should just j jump out and have a quick look there quickly. Maybe there's a snake. The last time I did this, and this is an awesome story, is that I couldn't see what it was. There was a squirrel alarm calling in a bush, similar to this. And I searched, 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 couldn't come up with anything. And one of you took a screenshot and looked through that screenshot afterwards and actually found a slender mongoose just hidden where I didn't see it. So. You guys can definitely help in on the search here. If it's a snake like a puff adder like we saw earlier, on this kind of substrate with so many different colors, it's going to blend in very well. So I need to be careful where I stand. There you go, the lap wing. <laughs> Mark break up. I will come back because you cannot hear me clearly anymore. And I can't seem to see anything. Always worth a little investigation and always nice to stretch the old legs. I'm hoping we're going to bump into dark shadow also known just as shadow. Some people call her dark shadow. At the moment, she's been very, very dark and we haven't seen her for quite some time, but it's a leopardess who frequents this neck of the wilderness. And I am craving some leopard action, as I'm sure a lot of you are as well. We haven't been having numerous leopard sightings over the last week or so. Penny Pine, you would like to know what is the difference between moths and butterflies? I'm actually not sure. 
Um, I'm not too sure what that could be. Must be something to do with the anatomy. Maybe James will know the answer to that. And as soon as his signal is stabilized, he'll send you across there for a second opinion. But I'm not too sure, Penny, I'm sad to say. It is something that I feel I should know the difference of. You get daytime moths and nighttime moths. It's not because some are active at night and some that are active at day. That would have been my initial possible thoughts is that moths are more nighttime and butterflies are more are more daytime, but that's that's not gonna that's not we're not cracking the code there because we've just seen the false tiger moth fluttering about during the day. It'll be interesting to, to see what the, the difference is. I guess it's a, similar to grasshoppers and locusts. There's not necessarily a huge difference between the two, I don't think, and the names can be used, I think, synonymously. It's the wings and how they the landing closed or open. Okay, Jandre has just brought up a good point and said that it could be something to do with the wing formation and possibly something to do with whether they land with closed wings or open wings. That may make them a moth or a butterfly, but I do know of butterflies that land with wings open and also butterflies that land with wings closed. So it's maybe more to do with the design of the wing. Um, I'm sure we're going to get to the bottom of this soon once you guys start letting us know your thoughts. Judy in California, you've provided us with some more information on the false tiger moth, which, uh, and you found a picture saying that, it, uh, and indicating that it could be a moth called a Heraclea. Interesting name, a Heraclea moth. Again, maybe that's just because they are two different names for the same beast. That is possible. An old name and a new name. There's a squirrel alarm calling. What could it have seen? Let's find the squirrel. And see where it's looking. There is a Wahlberg's eagle in a dead tree up to our right there. That could be what it's alarm calling at. But I'm not convinced. I am wanting it to be Dark Shadow, not the Eagle. Come on, Dark Shadow. Huh. The squirrel has now gone silent. And that makes me feel like we should abandon ship here. There's a limit to how much, I guess, you should follow up on any alarm call, but... I'm just not feeling that this would be worth pursuing. So we're going to send you back to James, and he is going to let you know his thoughts on the differences between a mooth and a butterfly. Toodle-doo. just come out of the Mluluati drainage line, which was, uh, well, I found the life of the Sahara Desert, really. Uh, not much going on there. So we're now going to drive Leadwood Road and see what happens there. Now, Penny Pine, you were asking about the difference between moths and butterflies. Um, there is apparently no definitive sort of difference, but there are a few kind of anecdotal differences. Uh, the first, of course, is that moths have a, they, when they pupate, so the caterpillar pupates, they both have caterpillars, obviously. When the caterpillar pupates in a moth, it does not form a cocoon. No, it does. The moth, the moth pupa will form a cocoon, whereas a butterfly will not. So they don't make a silk cocoon, whereas a moth does. Then another obvious difference is the fact that most moths have got 
unclubbed antennae, except, of course, the burnet moth that you were watching with Scott earlier on. They've got a big club on the end of the antenna, and that is unusual for moths. It's only the burnet moth that has that. Then, I mean, they're the obvious ones, which I'm sure you know, Penny, that the, um, they rest differently. A moth will rest with its wings down. A butterfly will rest with its wings up. A butterfly always has a, a clubbed antenna. And the, apparently, the wings of a butterfly, I think, are coupled, whereas the wings of a moth are not coupled. So the front and back wings of a, of a butterfly are more likely to be joined, but not in all species, than they are in a moth. So those are some of the obvious differences. Um, they almost always the larvae eat plant material, so caterpillars will eat plants. I think there are one or two that might eat sort of carrion, but I think that's very unusual. And those are the basic differences. But I think the major biological difference would be some kind of genetic trait that makes moths, or genetic ability for moths to create cocoons of silk around their pupa. And the pupa, of course, is the state of the caterpillar as it's going through its metamorphosis. And it's going from a caterpillar into a butterfly. It forms a chrysalis. So basically, I mean, it's an astonishing process. This we kind of, it's one of those many things in nature we kind of gloss over without thinking too much. If you cut open a, the pupa, of a caterpillar before it has turned into its adult form, you will find mush. There's nothing in there. It's just a, it's, it's like the, the caterpillar totally turns itself to mush before unmushing itself into the, the magnificence that is a butterfly or a moth. It is the most amazing process. And we don't think of it like that. We just kind of see a caterpillar, then we see a moth, and we think, oh, well, we, um, one became the other. That's not that unusual. It's very unusual. They look nothing alike at all. And many insects go through that stage where the youngsters look nothing like the adult versions. Even flies. I mean, a maggot eventually becomes a fly. And while one doesn't want to give too much credit to the average house fly, disease-bearing uh, vermin that they are, uh, it is amazing that they are, at one stage, a little white worm. And eventually, they become a fly. The incredible eyesight that they have, amazing reaction speeds, far greater than any human beings. Now, of course, I've got myself into the psychological space where I've seen a leopard twice on this road and therefore I expect to see one every time. Of course, the last 10 times I've driven down this road, I have not seen any leopards. And that has not stopped me from coming down here again and again and again in the hopes of seeing either quarantine or cornuma. Now, those two male leopards are now just over four years old. They will be looking to assert themselves. And for those of you who are new viewers, they, well, as I said, they're over four years old. They spent a lot of time here. They were, are the sons of Karula, the queen of Juma, the peaceful one, and another, we think, male leopard called Mvula, who is now getting on in age. And what's interesting is that that one I was mentioning earlier, Gajima, the male leopard who is not used to vehicles, he doesn't like being around vehicles, he, and, he is kind of incurring to the, from the north into Mvula's territory, while Mvula's sons, Gunuma and Quarantina, spend a lot of time on the little reserves to the south of us. And this is about as far north as they have pushed in the last few months. And I think it's quite interesting that Mvula's territory seems to be being squeezed from the western side, Tingana. I'm not sure what's happening in the east, but I think you'll find that at age 13, which is what he is now, he's going to start losing condition and his territory is slowly going to be taken, eventually usurped, possibly by one of his sons and possibly by Gajima. Scott has got a mating moth. Look at how cool this is. The ultimate in avian David and Goliath battles of Forktail Drongo chasing off an African Harrier Hawk. Wonderful. Well, I'm glad you guys managed to rush across to us in time for that. I'm also happy that James 
has managed to find the differences and clear up the differences between moths and butterflies. It looks like I've got some homework that I need to do. But I'm glad at least he sorted that out for you. And we found a herd of elephants. Very good. I'm just going to stop here and let them come up to us. The female on the right over here seems to be leaking very heavily from her temporal glands, um, which indicates emotion. And emotional ladies of this size, as well as age, can be a little bit scary. Whew. Look at how wet the side of her face is. I can tell that she's an old lady because of the the deepness of those temporal dents. I just want to make sure that we don't get on the wrong side of her. What's causing you to weep so heavily from those glands? Hard to be certain, but they do seem quite calm for now and just enjoying the snacks. Doesn't seem hugely impressed with the silver cluster leaf that she's kind of sampling over there. Almost just playfully. I just want to wait and see until she shifts her body. It may be that she's pregnant. I'm seeing a very swollen belly, but it may just be the angle she's standing at. No, she is definitely pregnant. She's heavily pregnant. You can also see her mammary glands are quite swollen in the anticipation for a possible new arrival so maybe just maybe we will be incredibly spoiled in the next couple of days and get to see her giving birth or at least get to see a very newborn youngster but uh, considering they have a 22 month gestation pe period it could take a while we're going to send you back to james quickly he's got some cuteness Quickly, everybody, a very small little waterbuck there, fluffy little fellow. Looks like he'd be quite good for a cuddle until you actually cuddled him, in which case he'd probably kick you to pieces. But he's sitting there with his mother, and very, very small. The waterbuck and the kudu seem to have been giving birth pretty much at a similar time. A gestation period not far shy of a year, so they'll probably mate again fairly soon. But that thing can't be more than two, three weeks old. Isn't it sweet? Mm -hmm. All right, let's go back to an even cuter little elephant. So as I was saying, considering they have a 22-month gestation period, for them to give birth in front of you would mean you have got incredibly good luck. But, as we all know, anything can happen on safari. And it would be a wonderful, wonderful event to be able to share with you. It's remarkable how just that small amount of rain we had five or so days ago has really helped the vegetation. It's looking lush and green comparative to the brown, dry earth that we were faced with a week ago before those rains. And it certainly appears that the herbivores are enjoying this change of scenery. Hello, Anna. You'd like to know if that temporal gland leaking 
is a good indicator for elephant bulls and must. It is, but it's not necessarily going to always be there. So it's not a sure indicator, but it could well be that must bulls will be leaking from those, those temporal glands. Basically, for me, as I, I, I describe them as emotional indicators. So any elephants that may be coming into season or out of season or that have been through a terrifying experience that's got them worked up or uncomfortable, they will be leaking from those glands. But a lot of the time, you know, they, they'll be relaxed. They're not necessarily going to be worked up and agitated and aggressive. But I think it does pay to kind of steer clear of the elephants that are weeping. Like in this case, I'm guessing it's because she's heavily pregnant. And again, a heavily pregnant female may be a little bit unpredictable, more so than one that's not going through those hormonal activities. Great, well, because they are showing those signs that require us to give them their space, we're going to leave them, leave them be. Or maybe we can just keep up one more time. I don't want to, there's a, just a little bit of space where you should be able to get you a few more views without int intruding on them, but I don't think thereafter we're going to have many good views on them. They're just moving off into a very thick block. Let's see if this youngster doesn't give us some attitude. It looks like he's thinking about it. Hi, Martin, in Johannesburg. We'd like to know if elephants will separate themselves from the herd when it's time to give birth. And no, not that I'm aware of. They will usually always stay with the herd so that they can have support and help from the other females. And the one time I have seen a very recently born elephant, it could have been just a few hours old, there was actually about five or six females all standing head to head, holding down their trunks, helping to lift up the calf. So I think uh, more often than not, they, are, 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 they stay with the herd and they don't actually separate. Wow, this is interesting. If we look between her back legs there, you'll see that she's not displaying the usual signs um, that you would see between the back legs of an elephant cow. Susie Wolf's just mentioned that maybe she's in menopause. That could well be the case as well. I'm having second thoughts on my pregnancy call, but it all just depends on the angle you're looking at them at. So it cannot be certain, but some kind of hormonal activity is going on, whether she's coming into season, was in menopause, or was heavily, or was kind of getting towards the terminal stages of the pregnancy. I am not certain. Zumi Jody in New Mexico, you would like to know what age will elephants stop reproducing? I'm not entirely certain of that. Um, I guess a lot will depend on the individual. Um, they live for about 60 years of age, and I'm fairly certain that they'd probably be able to give birth almost all the way to the end. I mean, obviously, less likely the older they become. But I don't think they're going to be like humans who, I'm told, should be what becomes a lot harder for, for humans to fall pregnant anywhere above and beyond 30. It starts becoming drastically more difficult. I don't think wild animals face the same problem. Lou's just corrected me saying 40 and I'd, I would beg to differ. I guess that's the beauty of it. It all depends on who you've spoken to. Um, it's certainly doable, but I'm told anywhere from 30 upwards, your chances become highly, uh, it becomes a lot harder to, to fall pregnant. I'm not saying it's impossible. It just becomes drastically harder from that point. 
We've spotted a very cool bird here. Um, directly to our left, Chandra, on this horizontal broken down branch. If you just zoom into it. Yeah, zoom into that branch. That's broken. Yeah, horizontal one, all the way in. And then pan slowly left. Ta-da! Oh, no. That didn't work out as well as I expected, because there's a branch in the way. Let's creep forward a little bit. There we go. How is that? It's a night jar. <laughs> what a bonus. And it's kind of fast asleep, but sleeping with one eye kind of semi-open, maybe just keeping an eye on us. It's got an, an incredibly short beak, but it can open its mouth very, very wide in order to catch its prey at night. As its name suggests, it is a night jar. It hunts at night. It's fascinating that you can hardly even see its little beak there. They've also got huge eyes. Again, you cannot see that now because it is asleep. Now, the problem with night jars is that they all look the same. Um, unless you open up their wings and therefore have to catch them, it can be incredibly difficult to distinguish between who is who. I'm just going to get my book out now and show you guys the various night jars. Now, they do all look the same, but I'm hoping the fact that it's sleeping elevated on this branch may help us to work out who it is. Now, the fiery neck night jar is the most... Well, here are, is the page of the night jars. They all look incredibly similar. And I'm just... I'm just reading through their habits, habits and movements and hoping that it may provide us with some information regarding where they may sleep during the day. A lot of night jars will typically sleep on the ground during the day. But I remember reading up, I'm sure I remember reading up on one that said they sleep often on branches, not necessarily on the ground. But I'm not finding that information in this book. Anyway, one of the night shows, and isn't that awesome? Isn't that absolutely wonderful? Here, hold on, let me just actually show you this. This is how in-hand identification of Southern African night shows. So this is how you tell all the differences between the night shows by looking at their wings and their tail feathers. And of course, we would have to catch one, and we don't want to do that because it may have a heart attack. Cool, let's have one last look at the bird itself. And then we will be heading off. How's that camouflage? Fascinating. Wonderful stuff. Okay, well, little night show, you sleep well on your little branch, and the rest of you are going to be heading off to James with some kudu. That's very special, everyone, that night char, and I wonder if it was lying on a branch, what did Scott say it was? I'd be quite interested to know which species it was. Very, very difficult to identify, especially if you can't actually hold them and open out their wings. This kudu is chewing the cud you can see apparently eating but apparently not not picking anything from the trees so she's obviously had her breakfast and is now re-chewing it now watch her mouth grinding circular motion all the ruminants do that they kind of grind and grind and grind now watch her throat there she just was basically sick into her mouth again and now she's re-chewing her food and that grinding motion that, watch your throat again. <laughs> it always amazes me. <laughs> that grinding is very, very specific and very crucial. 
she's breaking up the cellulose and lignin in the plant cells. Now you don't have to do that in the cells of an animal because they don't have a cell wall, which means things like carnivores don't ever have to chew their food. But it's those cell walls, the cellulose and lignin that make up the cell walls that make that chewing, that vicious or endless cycle of chewing that the ruminants have to go through so crucial. Now David, just next to us over there. Oh, she's run. It's the little kudu. It's obviously been separated by us, I think, from these two adult females. We drove in, in the middle between them, clearly. And she doesn't really know whether she should go and join her parents or her mother and aunt or stay there. There she goes. Ah, a kudu in full flight. There we go. Reunited at last. What a relief. Okay, we're just down the road from Beefle's Hook Waterhole. So let's get up there and see if anything's come to drink on this rather pleasant morning. It's, um, it's got to the stage of the morning where the, the kind of expectation of the dawn is dissipating in that wonderful kind of between morn, but between the, the kulth and the heat time has enveloped the place. A few of the insects are starting to get going and it's just a wonderful atmosphere around. One of my favorite times of day. Scotty's back with the herd of elephants. Let's go back to him. Oh, and it looks like we found a small bachelor herd that is trailing, oh, itchy leg, <laughs> that is trailing this little breeding herd that we've just left. What kind of a dance move is that, youngster? As we arrive, it kind of shook its head at us, displaying his thoughts on our arrival, so he may give us a little bit of attitude later. We also parked very close to a few bigger bulls on our left. I'm going to be able to get you, I guess, some great close-ups of the texture of the skin, not too much else from this angle. Look at that. Absolutely awesome. They're such calming animals to be around when they are paying absolutely no heed to us. I love that sound as they flap their ears like that. A very useful sound to know in the African bush because often you can hear that before you actually see them. Another interesting elephant noises when they flatulate. They've got quite a nice flatulation sound. This is my impersonation of an elephant bath. <laughs> and that can also be heard from quite a distance off. CDN girl, yes, it is correct. The elephant's mammary glands are in, fr in the front legs, which is unlike most four-legged animals, it'll usually be at the rear end. But they are more similar to us, I guess, with mammaries in the front section of the body. And the calves will just curl their trunk up and go and stand, stand kind of perpendicular to their mothers while they nurse. You'll have to just keep tuning into more safaris and that way you'll definitely get to see it happening at some stage. It's not uh, a rare sighting to see an elephant calf suckling. So that is something for you to look forward to. There's a Koki Franklin calling off in the bush nearby. Chip, 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 chip. I think it's having a conversation with one quite a lot further away that I can hear very faintly, but now Murphy's law has it that it's gone silent. I'm just going to creep forward to give Jean some better angles. 
now that this big Ellie has turned around to face us, we should be able to get some wonderful views. They really are on the go slow, and I love it when they feed so gently like this. Hello, Ravi Ottawa. You would like to know a little bit about behavioral indicators of elephants and what exactly it means when they lift their foot and sway it. It can be the kind of sign of maybe anxious anxiety. They're like a little bit worked up, but don't know what to do. It, it, it's usually with bulls that are in must. So it can often be a sign that this Ellie is not quite too sure what to do with itself. And you should be cautious of it. Another good indicator of that is when an elephant will drape its trunk over its tusk. That also is a sign that they're not too sure what's what. What, the, what to do next. But they will often also use their feet like now just for feeding, you know, to try and help break a branch. Here we go. It looks like he's going to, in conjunction with his trunk, use his foot to try and snap off this monkey thorn. Oh, this is going to be awesome. Come on. Come on. You've, surely you can try harder than that. But again, they really are on the go slow, not getting too worked up this morning, which is wonderful for us. I'm feeling very, very calm here. There we go. Good shot. It looks like now what he's going to do is just chew off the bark. Strip the bark and probably drop the rest of that branch down onto the ground. So specifically targeting a certain part of the plant, the cambium layer, which is where the nutrients will be transported from the roots is the plant storage system and I kind of guess not only storage but also they acquire their moisture from those roots before transporting them up into Zimov. But I did see a branch earlier that it had also been stripped and then dropped. So it's targeting the cambium layer of the monkey orange that they're fleeting on. Hello to Philip, who has just jumped on board our safari vehicle for the first time, and you have asked whether this is a mammoth. Yes, it is. It is a hairless mammoth, not like the woolly mammoths of many decades ago. And this is the African elephant. You're on safari in Africa at the moment. So don't be confused, it's not an Asian elephant. And it's wonderful that you have discovered us and look forward to getting to know you over the next few drives that I am here before I head off. I'm sadly heading off soon. But there will be more drives and more presenters continuing to take people on safari twice daily, every day. Let's creep forward. It looks like I think we've come across a completely another herd of elephants. The other ones were a little bit of a way off, and they seem, these ones seem to be heading in the opposite direction. Hi, Felicity. You would like to know how old will elephant bulls be when they leave the herd and start roaming around with other males or alone? Anywhere between 10, 10 and 15 years, I'm told. Is the kind of average age that a bull will start doing his own thing. They've got quite a slow development, not hugely dissimilar to humans, Felicity. They live for quite a long time, like us, 60 years, and they also develop at a kind of similar rate, I'd like to say, as us, regarding maybe adolescence and puberty. Hi, Deb. You would like to know when elephants have stopped fulling their big bellies, which 
consumes most of their day. That's all they do really is they feed permanently for about 16 hours every day. But they will also sleep. And you'd like to know whether they sleep standing up or whether they will lie down. They will lie down occasionally. Usually it's the youngsters that are more prone to lying down. The adults are happy to stand and sleep. But both can, and I've seen entire herds of elephants flat on the ground, fast asleep. But it's more often than not the youngsters. What's also interesting is that when possible, they'll try and lie down on something like a termite mound so that they're like at a kind of 45 degree angle. Usually, though, I'll find that elephants will be asleep for a few hours. They sp oh, black mamba, off you go. Black mamba, everyone. Mamba. Oof, I don't know if you can still see it. Can you still see it, Dave? No. It's crawling through. There's an impala there, almost completely unaware of it. I don't think the impala would be any danger unless it happened to stand on the mamba. I can still see its tail, Dave, in the... It's kind of on that dead stuff there. There, you can just see its tail going over the top edge of there. There, 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 there. It's standing up. You see its head up? Got him. You got him. That was very lucky, everybody. I stopped to look at the impala, and suddenly I saw this slithering reptile there. And the impala, I think, is looking straight at it. Can you still see it, Dave? Lost. I've lost it as well. I can't see it. Let's just go back a bit. Not a very big one, but a mamba, nevertheless. I mean, they are all over the place, you know. <laughs> and I suspect either slithered in amongst the grass there or climbed one of the trees. They are very adept in the trees. Yee! Love it. Very nice. <laughs> I think we're completely aware of it. Just kind of looked, didn't want to move too far, just kept an eye on the snake. Right? That was a really nice way to possibly end off my drive. Black Mamba, the first one I've seen out here. And Scott and Jamie have seen about 34 between them. Hello, Cathy. Uh, you say with all the sound that there is in the bush, do I ever have trouble sleeping or I lie awake listening? Uh, I don't, actually. It's like, a, it's like um, I think most people find this when they come out here. It's like a lullaby, the sounds of the bush at night, um, the, the night jars singing gently, the frogs and the crickets. I find it very much a, a very peaceful sound at night. I mean, if there's a lion roaring outside your window, obviously then, yes, of course, you'll wake up. And I have had that where um, a lion will walk right past your window going, ah, shouting his head off. Uh, sometimes an elephant will come and break a tree behind your your home and then you wake up with a start. But otherwise, the standard issue night sounds, although they are loud, I find very peaceful, whooping hyena in the distance, and it gen generally lulls me to sleep. Um, I'm not woken up by it. The one wild creature, of course, that will result in one waking up, and in fact drive you stark raving insane, is the mosquito, which will fly around your head, gang. And no matter what you do in the darkness, get rid of them and eventually you must turn the light on. Um, and the quickest way to deal with that is to turn a fan on. The mosquitoes don't like the fans and they also, you can't hear them over the noise of a fan. So often that's a good way of getting to sleep. My 
favorite sound at night is the sound of frogs. Uh, monkey man, interesting one. Why do we not, why are we seeing so many mumbas and no other snakes like cobras and pythons? I think mumbas, first of all, are very confident. I don't think they're nearly as nervous as some of the other snakes. And so they're prepared to cross the road in front of a vehicle. It doesn't worry them too much. I think they're quite common also. I don't think they're as uncommon as we think they are. And cobras tend to be a lot shyer. They're a lot more slow. So they'll probably be just a bit more shy. Pythons, I think that the dryness of the season has got something to do with that. I mean, I've definitely seen lots of pythons around the Salby Sands. Just nothing this year. So that would be my my guess. I might be wrong, though. And that's it for me, everyone. Thank you, David. Very entertaining morning with the hyenas. Thank you to all of you for your discussions. And just a quick one. Ellen, you were asking about why it is that I say Mvula is 13 and not 11, as his Facebook page says. Um, Ellen, it's simply because that's what Panthera who is the, they're the kind of cat people around here, and they've done a lot of research into all the cats of the Sabi Sands, and they've put his birth date as 2003, so that's why I think he's 13. He certainly looks like a 13-year-old leopard to me, um, but that's why. There certainly could be some debate over it, I suppose, but he looks like a 13-year-old to me. And a big thanks, of course, to Scott on the other vehicle, being filmed by the inimitable Jean Dre, uh, Louise in final control, along with Nikki. We will hand you back to Scott now for the last few minutes. Thanks again, and I'll see you this afternoon. So you've been discussing the potential difficulties of sleeping here at night with the sounds of the wilderness. Uh, Kathy, I am an incredibly deep sleeper. I, if uh, sleeping was an Olympic sport, I would be at the Olympics every year, winning gold medals. I can sleep like no one else. Um, whether I'm in a city or in the bush, it's actually problematic because people could be having a field day in my house or lions could be roaring right outside uh, if I'm in the bush and I would not know. I'm an incredibly deep sleeper. Things that do keep me awake though are heat and that is another thing that further complicates hearing any of the sounds of the night is that we've got fans blowing on us to try and keep cool, therefore masking out any si sounds of the wilderness. I think we're all just about in that boat. Um, we, we've got quite warm accommodation. Um, so yeah, sleeping is certainly not a problem for me, which I guess I should be grateful for being a deep sleeper. But sometimes I do wish that I was a little bit more of a light sleeper so that if lions roared, I would wake up and listen and enjoy and then go back to sleep thereafter. But that is not a benefit of the way my ears do their business and the way I sleep. Like James said, that mosquitoes are probably the biggest issue that keep us awake. Hello, Natasha in Ontario. You would like to know how the tortoises and turtles are going to cope during the droughts. Um, by turtles, you mean terrapins. We don't get turtles out here. I think turtles have got uh, flippers and they are usually in the sea, whereas terrapins have got webbed feet but with claws. So it's like a hybrid of a, a tortoise and a turtle. You get a mixture in between as a terrapin. Um, with difficulty, and a lot of them won't make it, but I guess that is the reality of a drought. It will be very tough times for them. But they will just have to be resourceful, I guess, if they plan on making it. Guys, thanks so much for all of your involvement in the safari. Two snakes, no big cats, but two different snakes. Both highly venomous, so that's a bonus. And it sounded like you had great fun with that black mamba, uh, James. Look forward to the afternoon safari with all of you. Who knows what will happen? Hopefully some of the animals that left the property will come back on during the course of the day and we'll have something to try and track down, but only time will tell.
Well then, Louise, for directing the show, to Jandre, who was on camera, and to all of you, of course, for all your contributions and questions and comments. We look forward to the next adventure. We will see you then.